Hey everybody, it's Chris from Military Aviation History and I'm here to answer your questions about the JU-87 Stuka dive bomber. This is of course in support of our crowdfunder for our new book, Stuka, The Doctrine of the German Dive Bomber. Thanks to your support, we have blazed through the year's funding goal for this book as well as all the stretch goals that we have initially set out and we've added a few more recently because yeah, your support has been absolutely amazing and we, we blazed through those first couple of stretch goals in no time whatsoever, it really surprised us. So, if you're interested in the book, if you haven't just uh, pulled the trigger just yet, I mean, this video, I'm going to be answering some questions of the people that have already uh, pledged, as well as Patreons and channel members. Do check out the link in the description below as well for, that will take you to the actual campaign. You can check out what you're actually getting with the book. It's going to be a lot of prime resources translated into English, giving you absolutely fantastic insights into JU-87. And even if you're already a connoisseur, of the aircraft, I think this book will uh, give you a lot of information that you'll appreciate. So do check it out. I'm going to strategically place it here because I've been told that I should be a little bit better with my branding and marketing. Apparently we Germans aren't really made for that sort of stuff. So uh, there you go, branding, marketing, done. Awesome, fantastic. Uh, before we go into the questions though, a little bit of housekeeping on my side. On the last JU87 video that I made, I'm really annoyed about this. I made a slight mistake. So you might remember when I talked about the automatic dive recovery system that initiates, well, it initiates as the pilot is, of course, lining up for his approach, um, you know, using the contact altimeter and so on and so forth, uh, trimming out the aircraft for that dive. But as he is dropping the bomb and as it initiates the dive or the pullout sequence, I said that the uh, trim tabs or the servo tabs that are in the back linked to the automatic dive recovery system are deployed upwards. Of course, they're not deployed upwards, they're deployed downwards or rather, they go back into a neutral position. So a little bit of housekeeping on my side, the original video also already has a pinned comment on it. Um, so thank you very much uh, to the two folks that actually pointed that out as the video went by. For some reason, I didn't catch it in the edit. Sadly, it happens, but there you go. Uh, that mistake sorted. Let's go into the questions. Uh, Quite a few ones to go through so uh, sit back relax take a sip of coffee or tea whatever your beverage might be and let's get going stahlfaust here wants to know why didn't the stukas get equipped with cannons before the d5 variant uh, is that part of their changing roles from dive bombing to ground attack uh, yes and no so initially the forward facing machine guns that the stuka has wasn't really considered all that important for the task that the stuka had all the stuka had to do was dive bomb from, let's say, like commencer dives, let's say at 4,000, 5,000 meter, dive from a specific pinpoint target. Initially, the Germans actually didn't consider that much uh, when it comes to a battlefield targets, so artillery position or trenches or fortifications. They were mainly thinking about sort of interdiction of logistics as well as stockpiles, as well also as specific objects within a factory, like for example, the electrical units that are too small to be hit consistently and accurately with bombers, but that Stukas could take out bridges as well and so on and so forth. Um, so in that role, of course, the Stuka doesn't need any forward-facing firepower, but of course you're going to give it some sort of machine guns uh, in order to ha allow it to strafe if required. And of course, immediately with the experiences in Poland, they realized actually the Stuka has to operate far closer to the front lines than we expected. And um, that, that, of course, then allowed them to also do these things. If there's no anti-aircraft defensive, if, if there's no fighters about, they can, of course, strafe. And they've doing, been doing that a lot in, in Poland, as well as in the campaigns to the West, and then, of course, also later over in Russia. But yes, as the D5 variant comes in, the Germans have started to realize that the role of the Stuka is changing and that they might require a few more heavy hitting guns with the 20 mils and the MG 151-20s in order to take out soft targets like trucks or even gun emplacements. It's a lot better having two 20s than uh, two 7.92 millimeter machine guns. So um, that, that essentially happens uh, for that reason. And uh, as well as that, I mean, mid 1943, we're talking here, uh, the Germans really realized this, the Stuka is no longer able to do what they are uh, what they had thought it would be doing throughout the whole time of the war. And that is that sort of what we nowadays would, I guess, call battlefield air interdiction. Yeah, it's like flying beyond the front lines and targeting specific points beyond the, uh, the line of combat. And uh, it's going to be pushed a lot more towards the front lines and doing specific close air support, um, which is quite a 
interesting subject with the Stuka in itself because it's really not laid out for close air support. But as it goes to lower altitudes with those 20 millimeter cannons, and of course later also with the anti-tank gun pods, it can of course deliver that in some capacity. Next question, Alex C. Hey Chris, my grandfather fought in the Red Army during the Second World War and I remember him telling me a story about being attacked by Stukas. He said that sometimes they would arm some Stukas with empty oil barrels with a hole in each end, allowing the air to flow through. All right. Um, have you ever come across any primary documents mentioning these oil barrel bombs? Or could this be a result of rumors or misinformation spreading throughout the Red Army? I have not come across any of this sort of information in primary source documents. I have, I have not. And I would be surprised if they do this, um, you know, dropping oil barrels or just having oil barrels there that, with a hole in each end. Um, I assume that maybe it is something that comes out of perhaps confusion during, during the actual combat. You're getting dive bombed, you're experiencing what the chief that would call a significant emotional event. You're not quite sure what's going on and you just see something and you think you've saw something even though it's something completely different. Maybe they were confused with drop tanks or something like that. So yeah, I haven't heard about that. It's an interesting story your grandfather told you, but uh, my documents, I just haven't found anything um, that corroborates that from, from what I have or what I know. Mr. Apple. I read that the JU-87 was able, adapted to operate from the uh, carrier craft Zeppelin uh, first as a dive bomber, but also as a torpedo plane, replacing the Fiesler 167. Were any JU-87s ever used in combat as torpedo planes? Uh, so you're absolutely right, the Germans did anticipate or did plan for a use of the JU-87 as a navalized dive bomber. They've put this in motion, they've even started constructing some navalized variants. It's the C variant that we're talking about there for this role, but not a lot of them were built and the whole project was essentially mothballed. Um, so no, uh, JU-87s, even though they had carrying capacity for torpedoes, in fact, some of the official manuals have this in the bomb or ordnance uh, loadout options given there um, as, a, as an option, uh, but they never used that in combat. However, for example, down in Italy in 1943 at Grosetto, uh, I think there was an Italian torpedo bombing school there. That's where some of those trials were being conducted, but never used in combat. Pony51 asks, why never upgrade the wing guns to the MG131 or the MG81 when already common? Well, this thing is a little bit into the first question, right? So strafing initially was a secondary concern and the, the whole idea of using it on the front lines uh, was already dismissed pre-war. And I, when I mean on the front lines, I mean literally on the front lines in the way sort of close air support that you see in the movies, right? Where, where you have your own line of soldiers and you have the enemy soldiers just 10 meters ahead of you and then the plane comes by and drops, I don't know, napalm bombs, rockets, whatever. Um, that's sort of the image we have of close air support, right? The Germans completely dismissed that when it comes to the Stuka. Uh, pre-war and then they had to kind of adopt it into that role uh, although it never really did close air support in the way that we think about it um, but yeah it wasn't meant to do that and I also uh, I'm, I'm, I would say that you're not getting that much use out of the 131 or the 81 I mean the 81 has the same caliber just a higher rate of fire whereas the uh, MG 151 is of course a heavy machine gun but you're not getting that much use out of it vis-a-vis -vis, you know a 7.92 millimeter machine gun that you already have so yeah that that is I guess the primary reason I haven't found any documents that say that they even thought about this and of course later on they go to the 20 mil where that upgrade in caliber uh, is definitely um, considerable at that point and of course also the ammunition plays a role in that as well of course, when it comes to uh, arming the Stuka with additional machine guns in order to strafe uh, ground targets, uh, we do have uh, gun pods that were of course used where um, multiple machine guns were fixed into these gun pods hung on one side per wing and that beefed up the, the firepower, the offensive firepower of the, NG, of the uh, Stuka quite, uh, by, a, by a, quite a margin. And that, that makes a big difference. Uh, Brother Fluffy asks, um, how were Stukas received by the crews throughout the war? Were they well liked early on, hated later on, maintained a positive negative reputation and so on? So 
From what I found is that overall as an aircraft, the crews seem to like them and appreciate them. So they did feel that the flying qualities of the Stuka are very good, um, that it's also a versatile machine. I mean, it wasn't used in many different environments. It was used as uh, on land, over the sea. It was used as a night bomber. Um, yeah, it was a versatile machine. And generally speaking, it, it did its part well if you make certain concessions to, of course, the age, first of all, of the platform, even by the start of the Second World War, and then specifically later on, if, of course, also uh, the limitations that each theater of operations placed on them. What you do see is that in late 1942, and we're talking specifically of about the Eastern Front here, uh, because the Germans have already realized in 1942 that if there is going to be a new combat or a new front on the western, on their western perimeter, right? So with the invasion, for example, a D-Day-like invasion, then they're not going to get that much use out of the Stuka. They've already realized this in 1941, 1942. But in 1942, at the end of 1942, you're starting to see the first complaints coming in from frontline squadrons operating on the eastern front saying that you know what, the Stuka is really starting to show its age now and we can still do our job, but it really depends on which Gruppe you're asking and where they're deployed and what they're doing at any specific point in time. And in mid-1943, that's when we're really starting to see that, okay, so um, this is how we used to do our missions, yeah, interdiction, flying into enemy territory, dropping bombs on uh, on on pinpoint targets and we can't just do that anymore because the, the, the field of operations doesn't allow it for it anymore. The, the Soviets have strengthened their AA defenses, they have a lot more fighters and so on and so forth and that's when you really start seeing the calls uh, from these squadrons saying hey we want something else, we want something better. Give us for example the Focke Wolf 190 which is actually a process that is already kick-starting in 1942. In 1942, late 1942, they're already thinking about switching all the Sturzkampfgeschwader using the Stukas to uh, Stachgeschwader, which uh, operate um, or which are supposed to operate the FW 190. So yeah, we're, we're seeing that. But of course, once again, it depends on the unit, it depends on the mission. And even, even later on, as the Stukas are being used in an anti-tank role, uh, sometimes you see uh, you know, confusion and the higher levels of the Luftwaffe saying, well, it seems our Stukas are still operating really well. We're getting all these claimed tank kills here. Uh, why are our, our pilots complaining about this machine? They seem to be doing well. But of course, it, it's, it's not that simple, right? Errol then wants to know, how important was the Stuka in winning the Battle of France? Would Germany have been able to pull off the Blitzkrieg without it? Blitzkrieg in uh, apostrophes, I like it. Um, okay, this is a big question because if we're just talking on a technical aspect, um, then you could say, yeah, I think, I mean, it probably wouldn't have changed that much because, but then, uh, then the question comes in, of course, if they didn't have a JU-87, what would they have had instead? And this is where we're talking about how is that vacuum going to be filled, not on a technical level, but also on a doctrinal level, because the Stuka comes out, out of this idea of an operational air war, right? That supports the army, not strategically, not tactically on directly on the front lines, but by hindering the enemy's movement into the rear and also to some part um, destroy his production uh, facilities and so on and so forth because although the Germans really don't focus on that that much initially during their first couple of campaigns because they say by the time we have destroyed the factories and this effect is going to be already visible on the front line, the war has already been decided. So that's why initially they don't really target factories or or um, yeah, any sort of uh, installation that has a delayed impact on the actual war. And it's mainly about logistics, stockpiles, um, reserves, uh, command and control, headquarters, and so on and so forth. And the Stuka Ju-87 is an expression of that doctrine. Mind you, there aren't actually that many Stukas in the Luftwaffe during the 
invasion of Poland. We're speaking about roughly 300 aircraft here. And production of the Ju-87 also doesn't really ramp up until 1942. I mean, they're operating on a production run of roughly 70 to 100 aircraft a month. And they're having a lot of pains trying to get that to 150, even by late 1942. So while we often talk about the Stuka, is it actually really that important to the Luftwaffe? And you could say that, well, they're just trying to keep that level of around about 300 aircraft, right? And that, I think, is the more important question when we, uh, when, when we look at what your suggestion here with the Battle of Britain, uh, sorry, not with the Battle of Britain, the Battle of France. The Ju-87 is just one cog in the wheel, but it is also an expression of a certain doctrine. Robert S. then wants to know, in terms of the dive recovery system of the Ju-87, uh, was that a unique feature to the aircraft or did other contemporary aircraft have similar systems? For example, when Junkers built the Ju-88 as a medium and dive bomber, did they include the dive recovery system? Yes, yeah, so some other planes had it and you're absolutely right, the Ju-88 was one of them. Um, however, generally speaking, it's quite rare. Most, most aircraft don't have that because yeah, I mean, first of all, you need to be a dive bomber really to need it. I mean, yes, of course, we're not talking about modern aircraft that have automatic pullout sequences and so on and so forth. Although not every modern aircraft has that even by now. Um, but back then it was relatively rare. Jean then wants to know, congratulations on funding the book. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, question. Mythical propaganda reputation aside, how did the Stuka perform when compared to other close air support? Uh, aircraft such as the IL-2 and the P-47. Um, I'm wondering specifically about uh, damage done or ton don tonnage damage and uh, sunk or ground vehicle kills per sortie or however you choose to define combat effectiveness. Um, so if we go with tonnage, sunk or kill claims for tanks, we're gonna run into a number problem very quickly because they're on the one hand side that's what's claimed and the other hand side is what is actually achieved and what is actually achieved is a uh, sometimes harder to corroborate with the evidence that we have available. So for example, in, the, in one of the documents that I have in my book, there is a German uh, officer, a Luftwaffe officer, who goes through a sort of chronological events of how anti-shipping um, was conducted in his specific Gruppe um, of, um, I believe it was Schutzkampfgeschwader, yes. Um, so Dritte Gruppe Sturzkampfgeschwader 1, that's what the document is about. And he explains that, you know, he, we, we've, we've done all of these attacks, for example, within two or three weeks to the south of England against convoys, and we have sunk this many tonnage. Well, I had to go through the actual British files on these, on these uh, convoys, and I found out that at most they have damaged it. But that took me a lot of time. So we're immediately going to start running into number problems there. So I wouldn't really define it that way. And I wouldn't also really compare it to the IL-2 or the P-47 because these are different machines. Yeah, even the Germans would have considered them differently. The IL-2, they would have called it a Schlachtflugzeug, uh, which means that it operates as a close air support aircraft. And the P-47 would be a Jabo, which is in itself in a retrofitted version, also considered by the Germans as a Schlachtflugzeug. The Stuka wasn't supposed to be that. And although it was pushed into this role, it was pushed so into this role in limited numbers and also with quite a few caveats attached to it. For example, not operating directly at the front lines, but against Soviet armor units that have penetrated the German front line and then that have to be stopped and contained. That's where, for example, the Stuka uh, tank hunters would come into play. And yeah, um, close air support is a byfort for the Stuka and it's really about interdiction and destroying uh, objects and um, positions away from the front lines. Then we come to a question by somebody whose name I can't really pronounce. Itway Third Division 5. I'll just call you Third Division 5. I'm gonna assume that's the name. Uh, how did the Ju-87 compare to its contemporaries in dive bombing alone, such as accuracy, speed, pullout altitude, ignoring the stats that we can already find on the web? Uh, I'm specifically interested uh, in the Douglas uh, Dauntless, as well as the Aichi 3 D3A. And I've read that the F4U Corsair was an excellent dive bomber and the Germans used the FW190 for ground support. Did that include dive bombing specifically? Uh, what about fighter bombers limiting it to a dive angle of more than 50 degrees? Okay, so in practical terms, if we ignore sort of 
the differences in uh, systems and also the fact that the Stuka is a little bit of an older machine. But in practical terms, you could say it's an analog of the, of the uh, Dauntless as well as of the D3A, of course, ignoring the fact that these aircraft were built at slightly different times for slightly different purposes, actually for major different purposes. The Stuka really was only supposed to operate over land, whereas the Dauntless and the uh, Val were obviously supposed to be or mainly uh, be used over water. Um, so yeah, that, that, that is a main difference there. But in practical terms, how they deliver the bombs, the accuracy they have and so on, it's very relatively similar from all the things I found. Uh, speaking about the accuracy, however, I, I would like to give some numbers here. So also in the document that you can find in the book, uh, I go through the whole sort of technical and training sequences of what the Luftwaffe wanted their pilots to do in order to learn how to drop bombs and how to, and sort of the accuracy they're aspiring to get, right? And they're starting really from, with their first couple of training runs with, uh, you have to hit the target within a hundred meters which is not that you know, that great, let's say. If we really talk about a pinpoint, we have this idea of dive bombers being deadly accurate, right? 100 meters is a, is a, is a long different, a diff, uh, distance. Yeah, I mean, that's essentially a football field, uh, both for soccer and for actual football. Um, but uh, then we have uh, 80 to 70 meters later on. Yeah, as you're being more proficient, you should not uh, throw your bombs further than 7 to the 8 meters from the target, but your average bomb drops, and this is really what's important, your average difference uh, distances should be between 50 to 30 meters from the target. So that's sort of the accuracy that the Germans are aspiring to. And from what I know, it's fairly similar with um, the US Navy as well as the Imperial Japanese Navy. Um, of course, difference to the fighter bombers, I mean, what is a dive bombing attack, right? Is dive bombing just going into a dive? And you know, does it matter really whether it's 40, 50, 90 degrees? Well, I would say yes, in practical terms it does matter, but then again, um, a dive is a dive, right? But of course, a dedicated dive bomber can go at angles that a fighter bomber generally can't. And as well as that, it can do so from altitudes that the fighter bombers usually don't operate at. You know, P-47 was go into a dive at 5,000 meters, and uh, then drop its bomb at let's say a thousand meters stage. Generally, you would not do that, and I mean like a steep dive at this point, right? They would operate at lower altitudes and go into a shallower dive and drop their bombs that way. So that's a practical difference between uh, both platforms. Um, one of the big advantages, however, for a fighter bomber or an aircraft, yeah, like the well, you mentioned what did you mention the Corsair and the FW 190s, because they're operating already at lower altitudes, they're also able to spot targets independently. Whereas dive bombers like a JO-87, if they're coming at four to 5,000 meters of altitude, they're generally only able to find schematics or find targets that are very obviously marked on the ground, either by the footprint they leave or by any sort of um, smoke or um, messages that can be sent and like the target can be directly identified from the ground and told and given uh, given as information to the Stuka pilots. So that's a big advantage that fighter bombers have that I think we don't recognize that much. Uh, Reichsbier Minister. Um, so I think you, you gave a couple of uh, questions. I, I pulled your first one because I, I assumed that you're prioritize them. Um, what were the different loadouts of the Stuka? Bombs, cannons, gun pots, and how, why, and when were they developed? Uh, are the special events that created the needs and starting points of some of this armament? So, yes. I think I already answered this in part in some of the other questions, but bombs, that's based on the original concept, right? Guns, whether the machine guns that were essentially a bifort initially, or then later on, the cannons, the 20 millimeter cannons, and then of course the anti-tank cannons, the 3.7s, uh, those were operational requirement. Uh, the Stuka's role changed throughout the war and that's how that came to be. And then drop tanks, it's simply because well, the Stuka in its initial configuration was very limited in range. I mean, the B variant of the Stuka, the first real operational variant, we're talking about a range that does not even come close to 500 kilometers. 
which is not good. Um, yeah, that, that is just not good. And also, you have to keep in mind, it depends on the bone load that, that you're carrying. So those 500 kilometers, that's optimistic. And I'm talking one way here, not you know, go and back 500 kilometers, pure one way. Uh, so you're talking about you know, a distance that can theoretically be flown uh, into enemy territory and back plus climb and so on and so forth. And uh, that, that bubble in which you can operate shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. So there those uh, drop tanks had to be uh, developed and they were and they increased the range um, quite by, by quite a margin. Um, so we are, we are operating, I think I wrote this down somewhere just in order to get sure that I get the right numbers here. So with the R2, the range goes about, again, depending on what bomb load we're attacking, uh, from 500 to 1,100 kilometers. So that's more than double of it. Um, which is pretty good. But again, if you compare that to some of the other dive bombers that are around at this time, like the Dauntless um, or even the, uh, the, uh, the Japanese Val, um, you can see a big difference between the Stuka's range, especially on the internal tanks, uh, and even the Stuka with drop tanks to uh, these aircraft with their internal tanks. Drakenifo wants to know, uh, was the Gunpot Stuka a good tank vehicle hunter or would it have been better off using rockets and bombs? Um, that's an interesting question. So it was definitely obsolete on the front lines as a tank hunter. In fact, the Germans realized this very, very quickly. And they realized, generally speaking, that tank busting or tank hunting or whatever you want to call it, is something that you cannot really do on the front lines because the aircraft involved, uh, even with something like the Henshin 129 where it has a lot of armor, they're exposed to a lot of anti-aircraft fire, they're exposed to enemy interceptors, and that's just the recipe for disaster. Yeah, they don't have the speed, they don't have the performance, they don't have the agility, um, well, maybe the agility, but not necessarily the, the survivability on the whole in order to be able to weather all this incoming fire as well as defeat enemy fighters, and the Luftwaffe is not always able to uh, support them uh, with, with fighters on their own, with escorts. So that meant that all of these tank hunters were used behind the front lines against those broken through Soviet armored columns that, generally speaking, would have limited AA support, if even, and would generally also not be covered, covered by Soviet uh, fighters. Of course, I'm only talking about the Eastern Front here because that's the only front where the Germans really did any tank hunting. So in that role, while it was not obsolete, it was perhaps obsolescent from a technical standpoint, but it still did a relatively good job because the job of these tank hunters, although we always think about destroying a vehicle, is really more about containing that Soviet breakthrough, allowing reserves to be rushed in from different areas, either the hinterland or from the, you know, the, the sides of the front, and contain and um, stop that breakthrough from happening. On a technical level, um, rockets could have worked, bombs could have worked as well. In fact, the army, the German Heer, when the Gunpot Stukas first came into being with the 3.7s, uh, was not exactly complementary of those. Because the Air Heer says, well, yes, you're shooting at tanks, but first of all, you're not even knocking out as many tanks as you say you do. And second, a lot of these tanks come with infantry on top of them. And when there's an air attack, this infantry hops off and then defends the tanks from, from German infantry or German positions and can also take those positions. But the Gunpot Stukas don't do anything against them. They're just dedicated against the tanks. Why don't you fly with bombs? Because if you use a bomb, you can destroy both a tank and suppress the infantry and kill the infantry that is going alongside with the tanks. So initially they were very critical of that. Um, but obviously later on the, uh, the Germans would be doing that role specifically with rockets and also bombs, first bombs and then rockets uh, with the FW-190s and they just kept the Stuka in a dedicated tank hunter role and that's probably also the most sensible thing of doing. Chuck S then wants to know, how did rear gunner feel about things? I've never seen a lot of info on the physical and mental stresses of the gunner. This is a good question because I actually tried to find some information on the rear gunners as well. And if there are any sort of specific training they have to go through, not just as being in the machine, 
uh, and what they have, have to specifically do in the machine. So being the technician, being helping with navigation, radio, defending the aircraft and so on, but also what some of the requirements were. And I couldn't find anything, sadly. So it seems to be a little bit more generic. Although it seems also to be that if you apply to be a Stuka pilot, generally what would happen is that you had to conduct at least one or two dives as somebody in the back seat before you were allowed to sit in the front seat and conduct your own dives in order to get a little bit used to that feeling of going into a you know, 70 to 90 degree dive, uh, which is something you probably have to get used to, definitely, especially the pullout. Um, so that's one way I guess I could give you some information, but um, yeah, sadly I wasn't able to find that much myself. Then uh, Zebel Zahnmöwe asks, Seeing the importance of dive bombers in carrier battles in the Pacific, do you think the Stuka could have served well in a carrier engagement based on a carrier in that role? Maybe as compared to actual carrier and dive bombers. Thanks for the good work. I don't think the Stuka would have been necessarily a good naval bomber. It could have fulfilled that role to a point, but it would not have been as good as some of the more dedicated machines out there like the Dauntless or like the Japanese Val. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I'm not even going to talk about the performance because obviously there's a performance difference between these two aircraft or these three aircraft, but specifically a range. So I talk, talked about it earlier, right? So the, the initial variant, the B variant, um, maximum 500 kilometers, the R2, 1,100. And then uh, with the D variant, because there's more, um, internal fuel load depending on what you're carrying you can get sort of 800 uh, on internal plus um, uh, sort of 1300 i believe with drop tanks so that's not ideal if you compare it for example to the spd where depending on what variant we're talking about the range could go up to you know i think 2000 kilometers or something like that um, and that's not even talking about the specific loadout options that you have with bombs and so on and so forth. So I don't think that necessarily J87 would have been, I mean, it could have done it, but it would have been a lot more limited. And yes, the navalized variant version could probably, um, you could probably have added more fuel tanks and squeezed out more range out of the machine. But even then, uh, you're talking about a liquid cooled engine, which is also not that great, I would say, especially, um, if you're taking damage. So that's going to be another limiting factor. And you have all these little, small little uh, incremental limiting factors that the Stuka has that some of the other aircraft don't have that were already uh, meant to be specific navalized dive bombers or that very on, early on in their development switched to that role and were conceptualized in that way. And the Stuka just didn't have that. It was really an afterthought, a byfought and at best. And uh, we can see that very clearly, for example, with the gear, right? So the gear was fixed, which is not good if you need to ditch the machine, but sort of the Germans were like, okay, so we have this, this fixed gear now. We're trying to navalize this machine. What do we do? Ah, okay, we, we mount these explosive bolts into the gear. So if the pilot has experienced battle damage and one of the gears was shot off, or if he has to ditch, he can blow off one gear or both gears and uh, make sure that he can uh, land on a flatter surface, which is definitely something you want uh, when you're ditching. Um, and you know that's, that just shows you once again, one of those things where they're like, okay, so we're limited by our design. We're trying to find a stopgap. We're trying to find a solution and answer to this, but it's always sort of, yeah, it's, it's an afterthought. That's all you could say about that really. World Traveler then, how did Hans Rudels input, change, and modify the Stuka throughout time? Barely, really barely. There's, a, there's a, this fascination with Rudel that personally I don't really quite understand. I mean, having read his book and then having read a lot of experience reports and after action reports from the front lines, what the, what the uh, Luftwaffe is uh, saying by itself on the Stuka and so on, I, I don't understand quite his fascination with Rudel. And um, this image that seems to be out there that this person was sort of considered as Yes, they were even back then, they were talking about him as being this, this pilot that supposedly destroyed many, many, many tanks. Um, but that doesn't necessarily translate into some, any sort of design changes to the aircraft. At most, maybe <clears throat> Rudel's experience, as well as the experience of his uh, 
fellow uh, fellow pilots were bundled up in experience reports that then they were given to other pilots and say, okay, so this is how these guys are hunting tanks. And this seems to be the most sensible way of doing it. You should do this the same way. At most, this is sort of the, the input that I can see from Rudel's side. Um, and likewise, sometimes you hear some of these stories about Rudel being this very influential figure when it comes to the A-10 Warthog, right? I mean, I have a video coming out on that uh, in the future as well. Well, amongst other things, we'll delve into that specific point and whether Rudel actually had an impact on the A-10 or not. And I would say, you know, just as a little teaser here, it's greatly exaggerated. It's one of those things that sounds, I guess, on the internet like a cool story. But once you actually look into the actual files and what happened and the chronology of events and when things changed in development, for example, with the A-10, um, I would be a little bit more cautious about that specific aspect. Um, before I go on another tangent here, Slim Shade Millionaire wants to know, um, or Schl Slim Shade Millionaire actually, um, were there any plans to put retractable landing gears on the Stuka when it went from a pure dive bomber to a more uh, to a tank buster? No, uh, because it would have been too much of an investment to change the platform at this point in time. I mean. The Germans knew by 1941, especially in 1942, that the Stuka was on, was on the way out. Yes, they tried to ramp up production. In fact, they wanted to ramp up production significantly, first from uh, 100 to 150, and then eventually 350 aircraft a month being built. But uh, that, you know, changing the design at that point just with the gear would have required a complete change of the actual aircraft, starting with the wings, of course. And then of course the electrical system, hydraulics and so on and so forth. It's, it's not worth the investment. It really isn't to just get a new aircraft by that point, I guess. Which also the Germans said, if we want to uh, build another dedicated dive bomber, uh, it's, it's going to be completed by the time the war ended in whatever way it's going to end. They say this already in 1942. They know they're not gonna get another dive bomber in the war. Hungry Cats, it seems clear from the beginning of the Battle of Britain that the Stuka was unable to successfully complete missions without plenty of air cover above. I think this was true for all of their bombers aside from night missions, right? Uh, I know that the Germans continued to use it because they had no replacement, but A, was there really no one who realized ahead of time that what any fighter could do to an unescorted Stuka and B, were they used afterward in any theater when the Germans did not have air supremacy or at least air superiority? So yes, the Germans, the Germans absolutely understood that the Stuka alone is a sitting duck. But let's start actually before the war. Before the war, fighters on the whole were greatly underestimated, I think, by any combatant during the Second World War. None of these, con uh, none of these combatants really understood that the fighter had already bypassed the bomber and would be the king of the sky, he would say. And that the only way in order to get bombers through is A, you escort them, and B, they have to fly a tight formation with plenty of defensive firepower. That's the only two ways you're getting all these bombers through. The fighter had bypassed the bomber. As the war was happening, as the experience with the Battle of France, the Germans had already lost a lot of Stugas there, then of course the Battle of Britain. Um, yeah, they knew that in a situation where air superiority or local air superiority could not be guaranteed, uh, that the Stuka is going to suffer. And that is also why they say, well, we're going in the future, we're only going to use the Stuka in the East. Uh, we're not even thinking about a mode of employment in the West. We need fighter bombs for that. Um, but I think we should also recognize the fact that Eastern Front and Western Front are two completely different environments. Completely different. And there is no such thing as a, um, air superiority or even air supremacy on the Eastern Front, even in late 1945. In the West, no discussion. Yeah. Uh, even by 1944, invasion, um, or rather liberation of France and starting with D-Day and so on, the Allies were ruling the sky. That's just how it was. They had superiority, if not supremacy, in the East. It was a lot more about maintaining temporary local air superiority 
to allow your own assets to do what they have to do. And as soon as they bug out, the fighters bug out. And of course, there were offensive fighter sweeps being flown and defensive flight, uh, fighter patrols being flown. But overall, what you often see is that uh, Soviet or German fighters would come into an area. Uh, they would engage any opposition that is in that area, flying opposition that is in that area. Five minutes later, the ground attackers are coming in, whether that's IL-2s or whether that is uh, fighter bombers on the German side or um, even bombers or Stukas, you could say. And they do their thing for, let's say, five to ten minutes, and then they bug out, and by that point in time, the fighters are also bugging out. That's sort of the rotation that you have on the Eastern Front. It's completely different uh, on the Western Front, where you know even the Allies could just mount these very offensive fighter patrols deep into German territory and pin the German Luftwaffe on the actual airfields. It's a completely different environment. All right, next one. I'm gonna just gonna have another sip of water here. Coolfish 308. Howdy, Chris. Howdy, Coolfish. Uh, hope your day is going well. Thank you very much. It is going well. Hope yours is going well as well. And congrats on their funding success for your book. So my question is, how much roughly did the Stuka cost for the unit and maintenance compared to uh, other single-engine German aircraft? This is the question that I'm still struggling with myself because I'm, I have some figures, but the problem is I have nothing reliable on the Stuka itself. And um, at this point, it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult for me to give you a straight up answer and say this is how it was and when I'm not sure about the sources that I have currently. But if I do find something before, something really specific, something where I can say, aha, this is black on white, this is how those figures and those numbers looked, um, before publication of the book, I will definitely put it in there. I mean, I have a whole chapter on the, sort of the production of the JU-87 as well, uh, looking at that from sort of a, me a meta perspective. Um, and information like that would absolutely make a perfect fit. So I will put that in the book if I find the information in time, but it, it's exceedingly difficult actually. Um, and if I remember as well, I will put it as a pinned comment in this video. So if you're coming at this, I don't know, in a couple of months time, maybe you will see that. If you don't see it, that just means I haven't found reliable information just yet. Um, Robert A wants to know, I'm aware of one project currently underway in the US state of Washington aimed to get one of these historic but also rare planes back in the sky and not just remain a static display. Are you aware of any other flight worthy restorations in progress? I'm not aware of any. I'm only aware of the one that you are of course talking about in the US at the Flight Heritage and uh, Combat Armor Museum over, I think it's Plainfield over in Washington State, right? Um, so yeah, if you live in the area, do check out that museum. Uh, um, I've seen their collection online because I haven't been over there yet and it looks absolutely fascinating and hopefully uh, once this whole corona business is and we can go back to our usual lives I can come over there and hopefully also visit the Flying Heritage Museum maybe film over there I'll have to get in contact with them hopefully otherwise I'll just visit I mean it looks like a fascinating museum definitely check it out and by the way um, completely different side note here but if you live next to an aviation museum and you haven't been because of the whole corona business um, but it is safe for you to visit now, do consider it. Um, a lot of these museums have had you know, a rough time as I guess most of us had a rough time during Corona, but especially museums are not swimming in money and um, do check out those, those places and visit them. And uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, some of them are even free. So just pass by the gift shop, buy yourself a nice little souvenir and support your museum that way, if that is something you're inclined to do, but it def they definitely deserve it. All right, Cole M wants to know, my question is how reliable mechanically was the JU-87? Was it like a Sherman or more like a Panther in terms of reliability? Oh, that's gonna get the tank boys started here. Uh, I look forward to the book and cannot wait to see uh, the, and cannot wait to see what stretch goals we reach. Um, so yeah, thanks very much um, also for supporting the project, you and everybody else. Um, so overally, I, overall, I haven't really heard many problems uh, of a mechanical nature with the JU-87. Uh, when the switch happens from the B slash R variant over to the D, there are some uh, failures in the gears, in the fixed gears, because the production for the new gear is lagging behind and they have to repurpose old gears from the B and R model that are um, structurally meant to carry a different load 
And so there is breakages in that point. So that's one of the main issues that I have found with, uh, from a maintenance perspective or a structural perspective on the J87. Um, but I haven't really found any sort of specific negative, uh, consistent negative point throughout all the Stuka 87 models where you could say, you know, that's the Achilles heel of uh, that, uh, that specific platform. Um, what is interesting, however, for example, is if we talk about the conditions that the Stuka was operating in. Uh, for example, obviously, as Germany was conceptualizing a continental war against its most immediate neighbors first, uh, certain things like making the aircraft uh, easy to maintain in winter conditions were neglected initially during the design phase. And this really bites them back in the uh, backside uh, in 1941, 1942, during those winter months, where they start realizing that especially trying to you know, get these hoses that, uh, that preheat the engine into the engine and get them uh, into the specific spots that you're trying to heat up is exceedingly difficult because the opening and maintenance hatches on the Stuka on the engine cowling aren't designed for this. So they had to make modifications so on and so forth and so forth. So from that point, standpoint, you could say, well, there were some issues in trying to maintain and also mechanically operate the JOT7, um, but they can be explained based on just, you know, that's, that's not what was anticipated to happen. Um, so yeah, Interceptor 57. You mentioned the gunner has different roles such as navigator and spotter. Was this role complicated by the fact that the gunner is facing backwards in the aircraft? He can also face forward. He can, he can just switch around in the, air, in, in the back seat. Then John A. Be interested in learning more of training of air crew. How field experience led to changes. Um, so in the book, of course, we have the complete sort of training manual for dropping bombs, for example, with the JU-87. So a lot of information is going to be in there, but generally the way the air crews would be trained is obviously they would be trained on the airframe itself. Then they would be taught the theory of dive bombing and how to aim your aircraft, because essentially you're aiming your aircraft. You're not aiming via the gun side, you're aiming your aircraft. And that is of course reflected in the gun side. And what your aim point is depending on, you know, wind conditions or your angle and so on and so forth all of that information in the book. And then you would go into practice sessions. And I already uh, talked about some of the sort of uh, performance figures that Stuka pilots had to achieve during the practice sessions in terms of accuracy, right? Starting at maximum 100 meters from the target, going down to at least um, a maximum of like 70 meters, but the average should be somewhere between the 30 to 50, depending on the exercise. Um, field experience, I think, does not necessarily impact the training of the units, but it is something that as new pilots are sent to the squadrons, they are being told, look, you might have learned it this way in training, but we're going to do few things slightly different. So for example, in training, they might have been, they might have only been doing dives or mainly been doing dives of 70 degrees and sometimes 90 degrees, whereas operationally, especially against anti-shipping missions, they might be doing dives that are more like 40 to 50 degrees. Right? So there's some operational variance in that, depending on where you're being deployed and against what targets. And talking about anti-shipping, I think this is definitely a point where field experience has more of an effect on the trading and the, uh, of the Stuka than any sort of other experience that was um, taken in the field, except maybe later on with the anti-tank missions as well. Because Initially, the Germans, there's only one Trägergruppe, which was meant for the Graf Zeppelin, who does, who does anti-shipping uh, training in the uh, Baltic Sea, so, sort of uh, between Denmark and uh, Germany. That's where they were, were, were training. Um, and later on, of course, the experience that the Germans have on the whole with anti-shipping then influenced the training that uh, the Stuka dive bombing schools were doing. So for example, in Graz, in Austria, there was a Stuka dive bombing school that had even a field cut out in the shape of a ship. And uh, pilots were supposed to obviously drop the bombs into the shape of the ship rather than on the outside. So I think some of there you can say that field experience influenced training and not the other way around. All right, so I had to interrupt that because my camera ran out of uh, juice. So it, uh, now fully charged, hopefully it'll keep uh, going for some time. Billy the Kid wants to know, were there any special tactics used by Stuka pilots or any training given to them when it came to attacking enemy vessels? Kind of already explained this in the previous question. 
But yes, there was some small scale training done against ships. In fact, uh, the Germans used some older um, hulls that were left over from World War I that they had kept in order uh, to use those as uh, targets for uh, training purposes uh, pre-war. But then most of the experience with anti-shipping obviously came throughout the war and uh, the experiences there were summarized and then distributed amongst the uh, various squadrons that, uh, that required it. Some of this is also, of course, in the book. Uh, one of the interesting aspects, for example, is against uh, cargo or transporters, right? Transport vessels uh, that weren't armed with anti-aircraft defenses and so on. Generally speaking, a, sh a shallow dive, sort of 40 to 50 degrees, was uh, recommended, whereas against convoys or targets that were heavily defended with uh, anti-aircraft guns, something like 70 to 80 uh, over to 90 degrees of uh, dive were uh, recommended. So, and beyond that, of course, you had uh, recommendations of where you're supposed to aim and how to calculate also the tonnage of your target. Petros D wants to know, hey Chris, was the Stuka used in an anti-partisan role at all? My grandma told me that she remembered them being used against Greek resistance around the Larissa area of Greece and that they would hear them coming down on their dive because of the siren. Uh, yes, so in the Balkans and in Greece, the uh, Stuka were used uh, on anti-partisan uh, missions and sometimes also blatantly against civilian targets. And also in the post-World War II era, uh, some of the commanders that were involved in the area and overseeing some of these operations um, well, were tried for war crimes. And uh, for example, Alexander Lohr was also, um, was also uh, well, executed because of it. OD wants to know. Uh, it's in with historians now to say aircraft did not knock out tanks. How do you console that with Hans Rudel and all the other stories? How did pilots survive flying their kites? Clearly they flew often without fighter escorts. Um, well, you already said it. How do you console that with Hans Rudel and all the other stories? We have these pictures in our heads based on some of the memoirs out there of video games, of movies and so on, that it's exceptionally easy to knock out tanks. Whereas we know from World War II, from the German side of the files that we have, but also from the Allies, that it was actually quite difficult. And it's always easy to make claims saying, well, we knocked out these many, these many tanks. And then once you look at the actual loss records of the combatant that had these losses inflicted upon them or claims inflicted upon them, you're starting to see actually the, the, these numbers do not line up. But this is not just about tanks, this is about, also about aircraft and so on and so forth. So um, yes, there are claims being made by pilots of all sides that um, said we destroyed these and these many targets. But if you look into the actual loss records, you can see the actual losses that were actually sustained by the adversary and you can quite easily then see which are the numbers you are probably more likely to be able to trust. Of course, there you can talk about some files perhaps uh, minimizing the numbers of losses that were inflicted upon you for, I don't know, political reasons or certain bias reasons, but generally that doesn't make any sense because you as the side that has losses inflicted upon them, you want to know how many losses you have because you need to, of course, replace those losses. So it, it generally doesn't make any sense. Um, Hans Rudel, I mean, there's, there's a big chunk of propaganda in there that also post-World War II myth-making, myth -making, and there's a, I mean, with, with Rudel specifically also, I, I would say that a part of the internet uh, almost fetishizes him. So um, you know, you're obviously going to run into people there that make all sorts of claims, but cannot be backed up by the actual documents. Um, but it was, should also be said, actually uh, on that, uh, there's a video by MHV where he, uh, I believe it's an interview with Dr. Roman Töppel, a German historian, notable German military historian, on tank aces and whether they counted their kills and so on. I'm gonna, I have a link in the description or on, or on the top here if I remember. Um, that might be interesting to look at as well for this question specifically. Yes, it's about tanks, but a lot of things can be transferred over to the air domain as well. Interesting uh, note about this, however, is 
uh, that some of the Germans also believe their own propaganda or their own kill claims to a, to a certain degree. So, for example, Milch, yeah, General Luftzeugmeister Milch, who was essentially the most important below Göring in the Luftwaffe, although in many respects he was actually more important than Göring. Um, he also, in some discussion, uh, went on this tangent and this rant saying that, well, if Rudel can destroy these many tanks, why cannot you know, every second average JU-87 pilot do the same? Um, you know, maybe because Rudel isn't knocking out tanks left and right and center. He's probably knocking out a lot of tanks for an aircraft, for a pilot, but not that many as, as commonly believed. JMB. Uh, did the Luftwaffe do any damage assessment on how accurate and effective the JU-87 bombing was? Uh, similar to those done by the Allies, as you described in a previous video. Um, so I think most of the tests that the Germans have done is pre-war. And that convinced them that, yeah, well, dive the bombing, you're going to get more accuracy. And these are sort of the accuracy... Uh, rates that we're looking at and this is what we want to achieve and there you go but they don't really have sort of the offer uh, the operational research studies that um, especially western allies do yeah so the, for example um where do i have do i have it in reach um yes i do have it in reach so for example one of the books i would recommend on this whole subject is of course air power at the battlefront by ian goodison 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 um where he also talks a lot about the ORS reports that the Allies did in, in, in France and uh, showing really that the kill claims that the pilots submitted for knocked out German tanks versus the ones that could really be attributed to aircraft. Um, the divide between those two figures is absolutely staggering. Um, but as far as I know, there is not a similar research uh, that has been done by the Luftwaffe. And then Vinny M wants to know, was the Stuka used by many air forces after the war? I read that a couple of countries did use them, but not a lot of information is available. You're right, a lot, not a lot of information is available, at least um, perhaps to us English, German speaking uh, folks. Uh, over, I guess, in Eastern Europe, maybe you will, you'll find a couple of authors that have written about this, um, but that's sometimes really hard to penetrate that sort of, um, you know, the different uh, historic uh, or historiography bubbles that exist. But yes, it was used in Eastern Europe briefly, even after the war. So, uh, for example, uh, Czechoslovakia, or in, in Slovakia, or in the territory what I believe now is Slovakia, um, the Germans actually constructed a uh, factory in order to build Ju-87s between uh, 1942 and 1944. And as far as I know, only about 20 to 30 were built in the end. Mainly, it was, initially it was just... I think, believe um, building tools and building uh, building parts for the ju 87s and later on it really tooled up it was tooled up and changed to an actual proper factory and then it came in too late to production um, but as far as i know also then uh, czechoslovakia had some some uh, stukas post-war for a certain amount of time and then of course there's also romania when they switched sides in august 1944 they still had a couple of stukas as well as Henschel 129s in the inventory, which they then used against the Germans. They didn't have a lot, I believe. The figure that I commonly see is about 20 ju 87 ds that were nearly all used up by the end of the hostilities for Romania. And uh, most of them, yeah, lost during, uh, during the war. And I'm not quite sure what happened to them afterwards. I assume they were scrapped or maybe parts of them find themselves in museums over over there. So if you're in the area and if you have a bit more information about that, that will actually be really interesting to see. That rounds us up on the questions. I want, just want to thank everybody who has already contributed to the crowdfunding campaign for our book, Stuka, The Doctrine of the German Dive Bomber. Uh, it's really, really appreciated. We thank you so, so much of making this possible because this is really a book that I wanted to write for a long time and with, together with Bernard now, we're really um, putting it together and it is made possible uh, by you. And yeah, if you're interested, do check out the website down, link down below, stukabook.com. You find a lot more information on the book there. There's gonna be a lot of primary information translated into English, a lot of additional information coming with that as well, giving you a look at the Stuka like you have not seen before. And I really do believe that. Um, so yeah, check that out. And as always, I wish all of you a great day.
and see you in the sky.